So I'm very grateful and, and privileged indeed to have pro Professor Brian Schmidt, Nobel Laureate, on this uh, Parallaxis tonight. And thank you very, very much for joining us. And it is really an honor uh, for me because I still vividly remember when I was in high school in 1998, when I first read about your fascinating results. And of course, being in high school and being interested in physics, I already read some of the books like, like the, the one from the late Steven Weinberg, the first three minutes, that was really a, a very important book for me. And the, uh, the book, book goes really into details about the possible future of the universe. And as things stood back then, it looked like that there, is, there are two ways for this universe to end. It will either slow down, slow down, but still expand forever, or it will turn back and end in something that you, I remember from your lecture, that you lovingly called the Gnab Gib which is the big bang backwards and it pretty much tells what it is and and this is a total surprise uh, for me at least after reading all these books it, it, your results you and your colleagues results show that it is not just it will ever end it will never end but it also accelerates which it was seemed to me from a complete outsider back then that it was something that nobody expected from that project but of course it turned out to be true and this eventually led to your Nobel prize in 2011. now uh, so my first question would be about this how and why did you start this uh, uh, high redshift supernova project and and after you figured out what what you figured out how could you first of all convince yourself that it was actually the result and 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 you know extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence so after that how could you convince the scientific community to accept something totally out of the mainstream great well i mean the reason we decided to do the experiment uh was really tied up with just my scientific interests so i did my phd uh, from 1989 to 1993 at Harvard. And when I was doing that, I was measuring the Hubble constant. That's how fast the universe is expanding now, right? And, you know, it really comes down to measuring distance and redshift. And distance, I think we all understand, you have to, in our case, measure distances by how bright things appear and do a bunch of corrections to try to get that into meters. And then you want to measure redshift. So that's how much space stretches. You know, it was originally thought to be a Doppler shift, but I think we think it was actually the creation of space between or the stretching of space. And light travels through the stretching of space and it's it becomes elongated. Uh, its wavelength becomes elongated, so its redshift uh, becomes larger. It becomes a larger wavelength. So. I did that for three years or four years during my PhD and got a number. Uh, and then uh, I was doing a, a postdoc at Harvard where I had done my PhD because this was more on the Smithsonian side. And I was trying to figure out what to do next. And a bunch of things happened, uh, which included new technology, big digital cameras, the Keck telescope, a 10 meter telescope, and an understanding how to use very bright exploding stars, supernovae, uh, that came out of my colleagues in Chile, how to use them to measure uh, very precise distances. And so in 1994, I kind of pivoted what I was doing, helped create a team with Nick Sunseth down in Chile. Uh, and our idea was to go in, measure the Hubble constant nearby, and then effectively measure the Hubble constant back in time by looking at really, really distant objects whose light would take you know, 5 billion years to reach us. So why do we want to do that? Well, uh, what's the future of the universe? What's its past? How much stuff is in the universe? And we knew from the theory of general relativity that how much the, university, the, the universe weighs or how much it's, what its density is, is related to its trajectory, how much it's slowing down over time. And therefore you can Kind of figure out what the future will be and it also the geometry of space is related to this as well that is gravity affects the curvature of space and so we could learn about the shape of space its its future uh and essentially the density of the universe all in one go 
So how good is that? So that was my pitch to come to Australia. Uh, and, uh, you know, I started a three-year job here as a young postdoc, uh, working with this team around the world. And after three hard years, uh, we got the answer toward the end of 97. And Adam Reese and I were kind of working on that, just trying to understand why the universe seemed to be accelerating. It didn't make any sense. And I mean, it had been talked about and mis many mistakes had been made by people claiming the universe was accelerating, but it was always kind of like a joke. The accelerating universe was a, a, a was had been everyone's mistake mm -hmm. and it had been a mistake many, many times before. So it was pretty scary for us. And, you know, we had to go through every little bit of what we did bit by bit asking ourselves about the uncertainties and all these things. And in the end, after a couple months, uh, Adam and I kind of agreed that this wasn't going away. And then we, well, it was time to take our first preliminary analysis to the team. And then the team had to go through the same thing. So the important part was convincing ourselves that we had taken care of all the known knowns, the known unknowns, and that there were no obvious unknown unknowns that we were <laughs> going to get slaughtered by the community. And that's, of course, what the community wanted to see. But the community, when we made that measurement, were rightfully skeptical. But it turned out it fixed a whole bunch of problems in cosmology that we could not reconcile. Uh, we could not reconcile the Hubble constant and the age of the universe. We could not reconcile the... Uh, fact that when we made measurements of dark, uh, of, of gravity, that we always got a number which was about 20% of what you might expect from the theory of inflation, which Steven Weinberg was quite a strong proponent of. And this kind of unified all these problems and said, well, this is the issue. It solves all those problems. And so people kind of liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew there were two teams working on it. So that meant, you know, it wasn't just, it, it was genuinely worthwhile looking at in detail, but also other people were able to go out and test it using different methods over the coming years. So that is what in the end really sealed the deal, testing it. All right, so it, uh, and it also, you mentioned that it was everybody's mistake before, and I myself also read some way earlier papers that were trying to figure out uh, how, uh, from for large redshift objects, how big the Hubble con constant was, but that was before the supernovae idea that you mentioned, that was based on galaxy clusters or something like that. And now in retrospect, looking at those results from now, uh, do they still seem incorrect or they were just not convincing enough? Uh, I genuinely think they were probably incorrect. Uh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> That's good. That's important to, to, to set. Yeah, yeah, so using objects that had changed dramatically over time, galaxies. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it turns out it's just really, really hard even today. You know, no one would yeah. try to measure the accelerating universe with those techniques. So I guess another way to say it, is no one tried to test our method with any of the previous the, the the past mistakes um, mm -hmm. because they were seen as being sufficiently flawed for that not to occur. Right, and so so then please t tell our listeners uh, why is the supernovae technique is more uh, uh, accurate? So how, how, why does it produce? Why why did it produce acceptable? results for, for this uh, survey? So the first thing is that uh, they're really bright point sources. So a point source uh, means you can't actually see any structure. It is, as far as we're concerned, infinitely small. So it means it's much easier to measure. So they're really bright and they're really easy to measure. The other thing is they're a single star, all right? And so a galaxy is like, a you know a colony of stars and the stars live and die and so the colony of stars a galaxy ages and changes as the universe ages a single star and we think we understand to first order how these things uh, occur they occur when a 
white dwarf star, which is the remnant of a star like our sun, exceeds a certain mass, roughly 1.4 times the mass of our sun. And so there are many reasons to believe that the changing of that process over time, which is mainly governed by nuclear physics, uh, isn't going to change very much back in time. It might change a tiny little bit, but it's not going to change much. And the beautiful thing is in the nearby universe, we have all sorts of galaxies, young galaxies, old galaxies, galaxies with a lot of chemical uh, chemicals in it other than hydrogen and helium and ones that have very few. And we can kind of test all those environments nearby. And what we find is they're, they don't change much. And the other thing that's really important is they're just much better uh, distance tools than anything anyone had ever done before. They're you know three or four times more precise. And it turns out when you're trying to use a tool uh, to measure distances in astronomy, it the, the the problems come as the square of the uncertainty. So it may be four times more precise, but that kind of tells you the problems are 16 times smaller. And uh, so that was another really important bit. All right. Okay, and so now that having established the fact that the universe is actually expanding, it be I mean, in an accelerating manner, of course. Now, what is, if there is any scientific consensus on what causes this acceleration, this dark energy thing? So from the outside, you, you mentioned that, that your discovery actually fixed a lot of problems, but also as it normally happens, it also opened way more questions. So like, since then we have absolutely no idea or ideas, yes, but we don't know what the universe, the vast majority of this universe is made of. <laughs> So, but, but of course, I'm not following these days. So, so what is there a consensus now about that? Well, we know it's something like what we call dark energy. So dark energy is just the generic term for what Albert Einstein created in 1917, which is a essentially a term in his equations, which we would think of in modern terms as being the density of the vacuum. So it is the energy associated with empty space. So it has a density per cubic meter, and as space expands, that density is always there. And it's inside your atoms, it's inside my atoms, it's inside the atoms at the beginning of the Big Bang, it's inside every piece of space, and it's immutable. Now it turns out that very simple idea of Einstein made very specific predictions, and it is exactly what we have found to describe the universe that we've measured and everyone has measured since us. And we need about 70% of the universe to be this stuff. What is this stuff and why is it there? We don't know. Uh, yeah. The universe uh, yeah. seems to have it. The question we have, is it just an intrinsic property of the universe? Or is it a manifestation of some, you know, form of quantum mechanical particle physics not yet discovered? At this point, it is completely consistent with just being born with the universe, always here, always has been, always will be. And the reality is we don't yet have a theory that connects gravity and quantum mechanics. The best theory we have is string theory. And one of the things that uh, the Discovery Accelerating Universe and Dark Energy did is it made uni the universe able to be flat. And it gave us the right age for the universe, made the universe to be able to be flat. And that was consistent with the idea of inflation, that the universe was exponentially you know, growing with something like dark energy when it was really young and that dark energy disappeared in the first tiniest fraction of a second. One of the things that it broke was string theory because string theory does not like uh, a positive cosmological constant. Uh, and it's still a problem for string theory unless you have uh, a whole slew like 10 to the 500 possibilities of universes and then it turns out we use what we call the anthropic 
uh, principle, which is the only universe that we could exist in uh, is one with this very rare, small chance of a positive cosmological constant, and that's the solution to the problem. Not, I wouldn't say a brilliant solution, but if it's true, then you kind of stuck with it. But unfortunately, it starts feeling more like metaphysics than yeah, physics. Yeah, so that's why I wanted to ask that would it would it be possible to disprove such a statement? So I mean, for for me, uh, uh, kind of for a good scientific theory, it's very important that you can actually uh, find counterexamples for it and and eventually falsify the, the the statement. But but in statements like that, that sounds very metaphysical to me. Uh, so, I think it's not possible. So, so do are these even physical theories in the stricter sense, or are these just uh, like mental constructions? So, I, I think you're right. As long as we cannot sensibly test it, um, at least indirectly, and have it make predictions, uh, it's a problem. Uh, and I would agree that we haven't yet really come up with anything satisfactorily to to test it. But people are trying. And so I would not give up hope. I would not give up hope of not being able to test it. But you're right, at this point, we cannot. Uh, and so it is an idea uh, amongst others. And to my mind, it is an untested theory until we can actually go out and make some sort of prediction with it that you know, whether or not it's dark energy and the acceleration or something else, it, it really does need to test something. So uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I think as long as we really can't test it, uh, it remains an idea rather than a physical description of the universe. Oh yeah, okay. So there's still a lot of work to do for the future generation of physicists, obviously. Uh, and and speaking of which, <laughs> speaking of which, you are besides being the vice chancellor of the Australian National University, but but if I know it correctly, you are still leading the SkyMapper telescope project. The, the, well, the, I've, I've actually, yeah, I've given up on leading the telescope. I'm still involved with it a little bit, but uh, I, I I decided running the university, I had to let someone else. So it's continuing yeah. to go, but that was my last project before I started as vice chancellor. All oh, right, okay, it's totally understandable, but but still still could you please tell our listeners about the aim of the project? What is the the goal of the SkyMapper telescope survey project that that you were heading for for since 19 for 2014, I think. So for quite a long yeah, period. It started in so SkyMapper, if you think about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which mapped out in great detail, the Northern Hemisphere, um, we didn't have the equivalent thing in the Southern Hemisphere. So I started a project uh, to map the Southern sky in 2002. I got uh, material to uh, update a telescope called the Giant Magellan, or the Giant Magellan, the, the, the Great Melbourne Telescope, which uh, was famous for doing the microlensing experiment at Mount Stromlo. Uh, we did a bunch of uh, gamma ray burst work with it. Uh, and so the project was sort of commenced on the 1st of January 2003, and we had a bushfire come through and destroy the telescope on the 18th of January. So uh, nine years later, <laughs> we had a working telescope sky mapper uh, to continue the project. And the idea was uh, we needed a digital map of the southern sky, but I also had the idea with colleagues to use a, a specific set of color filters that allow us to break the, you know, the colors of the stars into very specific bands. And we could pick out uh, the chemistry of stars. So the universe was born with um, hydrogen and helium and a tiny, tiny amount of lithium. And so it's essentially those stars have very, very simple spectra uh, that are made up of only those two elements. And spectra, uh, which are the, the rainbows of colors of stars, get chopped up when you add other elements. And so we, with this project, have been able to identify the first stars of the Milky Way because they're the ones that are uh, don't get chopped up by the chemistry. And indeed, we have found the most metal-poor stars in the galaxy, essentially the most 
pristine stars. They're not the first stars. We can actually see the uh, products of the first supernovae in them. So we've actually been able to use them to go through and understand the Milky Way and the first generation of stars uh, by this indirect means. And so that's been a really fun bit uh, and really cool as it relates to my supernova work because they are uh, chemically enriched by exploding stars. And we can, just as we can fingerprint what a nuclear bomb did by the radioactive fallout, we can effectively fingerprint what the supernova was like by its radioactive fallout into these stars. Uh, and uh, so we've been systematically doing that, also being able to look for the most distant black holes in the universe and providing a whole bunch of other information for all sorts of other people's projects who need to have this data to go out and study things in more detail with big telescopes. Yeah, amazing. Well, and, and as a last question, now now something completely different. Uh, wine, wine production. <laughs> so you, you, you were known to be a very successful and renowned winemaker in Australia. I remember from, from the news that, if, if, is that correct, that you actually gave a bottle of your wine to the king of Sweden after receiving the prize? Yeah, so so how did before you... I got the prize. Yeah, before oh. I gave it before I got the prize. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> he had brought, he, when he handed, when, when he uh, shook my hand on stage, uh, the king said, thank you very much for the very wine. It was very tasty. I really enjoyed it. So he had already drunk it. Uh, okay, okay. But it, but you gave to gave it to him before the price was announced, right? <laughs> no, I gave it. No, that would be a conflict of interest. Oh, I, yeah, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> so the way you give the king a wine, you don't just go up and say, king of love, <laughs> sure. here's a bottle of wine, right? Yeah. So I brought it with me from Australia. And you get to Sweden kind of seven days before the prize. And so through uh, the diplomatic channels, and I had a diplomat with me the entire time, he made sure the king got it. And then the king had it for dinner a couple of days later. And uh, anyway, that was good. I was kind of thinking you might lay it down for a while. But hey, you know, it was a good yeah. bottle of wine. Yeah, amazing. So, so, the, but really, the question is, how did your obsession with wine production started? You're from Montana. Well, Montana is not widely known to be, to say the least, as a wine producing region. So, how did it all start for you? Yeah. So, I I, I grew up in Montana and then moved to Alaska. So, oh, Alaska yeah, even is even worse. <laughs> even worse for grapes. So, <laughs> when I went off to uh, my, it actually started with my first date with my wife. So we were at Harvard, she's studying economics, I'm studying astronomy. And uh, so I was pretty young, I was probably 22 or 23 at the time. And she's from Australia. And we're out at a restaurant and she hands me the wine list and said, what should we get? And I looked at the wine list and was completely dumbfounded because I had never ordered wine on a wine list before. And she looked at me and said, okay, if you're gonna date an Australian, you're gonna have to learn something about red wine. So I started learning about red wine. And we used to, at the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard, uh, have lots of um, wine tastings there with a, a very, uh, you know, a, 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 a person who uh, people will know in the planet, in the planetary astronomy area, Dave Latham, uh, and, uh, and many of the, the your uh, Hungarian astronomy friends uh, used to participate in these as well. Uh, and we would even have good uh, good at Hungarian wine sometimes. So we just started learning wine uh, a bit together and have wine tastings every Friday afternoon at the end of, of a hard week. And uh, I became interested. And then when I moved to Canberra, uh, after about four or five years here, uh, we moved out to the countryside. And there was just a perfect place to put a vineyard. And Canberra is, uh, was a rising uh, uh wine district at the time and said, why not? I had tasted many of the wines here. There were excellent wines made here. So figured you only live once. Why not make wine? And, you know, it's a, it's a big thing to do. It's kind of crazy, but I'm glad I did it. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you so much for 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 uh, sharing this story with us and and for the whole interview. Indeed, it was fascinating. Thank you so much for your time. And it was really a pleasure that you were here with us tonight. Thank you very much. My pleasure.
A hozzánk hasonlóan neked is szenvedélyed a tudomány és a fantasztikum mély szívesen lépsz be a Parallaxis univerzumba, arra kérünk, hogy legyél a támogatónk és segíts te is az ismeret terjesztést. Látogass el a patreon.com per Parallaxis címre, ahol a különleges tartalmak mellett már akár napokkal korábban hallgathatod a Parallaxis podcast legújabb részét. patreon.com per Parallaxis